Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm beyond excited to introduce my guest with me here. We have the amazing and legendary Lex Lang, who has done voices for Dr. Doom and Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, Major Varag in Star Wars Resistance, Candlemaker in Doom Patrol. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to the amazing Lex Lang. Thank you for coming and thank you for being here. It's awesome to be speaking to you. <laughs> It's so awesome to be speaking to you right now. It's a complete honor and a complete privilege to be able to be saying oh, I'm speaking to nice. you right now. I've grown up with your voice. <laughs> I didn't even know I grew up with your voice, which is funny because I was looking at your catalog. You have an immense catalog. You've been in video games, TV shows, movies. You've been in so much stuff that I didn't yeah. even know that <laughs> I've grown up listening to you for since I was a, like one. So it's just yeah. so awesome to be speaking to you right now. <laughs> and thank you so much. Uh, thank you. What is one word you would use to describe your childhood and why would you use that word? To describe my childhood? Okay. Um, I would probably describe it as the word would be summer. Uh, I lived I lived in Arizona and uh, as a child, like from five years old till probably 20. And uh, I, what I really remember the most about living in Arizona besides going to school, you know, it was the summertime we had a pool and it was always a great time for my friends and i to play and joke around and you know have lots of laughs and lots of fun so we, i'd always really be looking forward to the summer as a child and um that some of my fondest memories about childhood come from you know summertime and playing with my friends and swimming and yeah so I, that'd probably be probably would be it um as I got older in Arizona, I started acting and doing that kind of thing. And then it became all about doing uh, plays. I was in a lot of theater as a kid and as a young adult. And, um, but yeah, I would say summer and like family because uh, my parents worked, but um, on the weekends we would all be, you know, uh, hanging out together and we'd do a barbecue on Sundays most of the time. And it was a lot of fun. Very wholesome. and. Uh, upbringing you have <laughs> very yeah it was, it was all right you know i mean it was like any family you know there were ups and downs and trials and tribulations that families have but um, for the most part i'd say i was really lucky i was blessed to have a family that supported me and uh you know what what i was excited about as a kid they were in support of and you know as long as i did well in school they were like okay whatever you want to do outside of school if you're still having good grades you can pretty much do it you know so that was cool is, when I, I was a kid, always, well, no, go ahead. Oh no, I, I was gonna say, as a kid, did you always imagine you'd be doing what you're doing now? Um, yeah, you know, when I thought about like what I wanted to be when you, someone asks you that when you're 10 years old, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would always say actor or, um, I didn't, you know, it was most of the time it was actor. I really, I really enjoyed doing acting stuff. When, when we were kids, like speaking of summer, we'd have family relatives come and visit us and we'd always do like a show for the family. And it would just be like st stupid little skits we would make up as kids or we'd do like some Monty Python-y sort of thing. Uh, you know, we'd put a, hang a blanket up as our backdrop and we'd have like a little stage that we would basically, you know, put a like a jump rope to be the boundary of our stage and we would do skits and funny things. And, and that, that, I got the bug then and then, um, I was uh, in grade school, I played a few different musical instruments, um, but nothing that I, I never really got into music. Seriously, it was more for my family. My father thought it would be good for me to learn some music too. So I, I played the violin when I was like seven years old. I, I wasn't crazy about it because, you know, showing up to school with a little violin case when you're, you know, seven or eight years old, it's not very cool. You know, it's like you made fun of real quick. And then when I was in like seventh or eighth grade, I, I started playing what was called the French horn, which is like a you know, the curly horn. That has, and that was okay, but it was just sort of like background in the orchestra of the school. And I was like not excited about that at all. And um, when I was about 14 years old, I started playing piano a little bit. And uh, that's when I really started getting a little more into like, oh, I can write a song. That's cool. That kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we kind of have the um, same thing when it goes to music and relating to it. Um, I used to play the um, trumpet in middle school, and I, I, okay. I've, I've always had the music bug. I've always loved music. Get, I'm yeah. starting to get more into it. I mean, I got a guitar, right? 
here if you can see it right. i'm starting to get right. into that stuff, stuff now but um what were your earliest memories of creating voices or well first off how did you start making voices um when my friends and i would create these skits a lot of times we would do it on a, a cassette recorder and we would just like pretend we were doing things it was kind of like around the time that star wars came out I had a friend of mine and myself that we would do like, we would record little bits, little audio clips from Star Wars. And then we would put those little audio clips into another cassette to make like a funny skit out of it. And when you're 10 years old, you know, you're not writing about anything that specific. So you, know, you might be writing about like burping or something, you know, it's like a silly kid thing, you know? So, you know, uh, you know, we'd, we'd ask, you know, we asked 3PO, can you burp? And then we'd hear 3PO saying, that, of course I can, sir. It's like a second language to me. You know, like we'd put those little clips together and, you know, really crack ourselves up. And so we started doing voices and, and pretending we were like ring announcers for big shows or, you know, do commercials and things like that. And so it was really, it was a lot of fun as a kid doing that stuff. Um, as far as creating voices or doing like, hmm, like a voice per se, like a voice acting thing. Um, really didn't think about that too much. When I was about 12, my brother, maybe I was 10, uh, my brother uh, enrolled me into this uh, comedy competition uh, that was for Seagram's, was an alcohol company that was doing this big t tour of comedy clubs and they were looking for like the Seagram's next big comedy thing. And my brother enrolled me into um, the competition and when I went to do like my little bit um, part of it was doing an Elvis impression and so I was doing this Elvis impression and I was doing also there was a songwriter singer songwriter named Paul Williams who was in this movie around the same time as that was going around and I really liked the soundtrack from the movie it was called Phantom of the Paradise and so I was always trying to imitate him because he has a very unique singing voice um, he sort of has a thing with his voice that's sort of in here, you know, like it's kind of a quirky voice. And so um, I remember doing that and listening back and forth and trying to really lock down on how does he sound? How does he sound? And I went and I auditioned for that Seagram's thing and they thought it was such a kick and so funny that they said, well, we're not going to put you in the comedy competition because you really don't have a lot of material, but we would like you to MC the comedy competition when we have it. So I was like the MC for this comedy competition that give me little things to say in between each of the actors, I mean, each of the comedians. And I would uh, do that or a little impression or a little something in between. And uh, it wasn't until I was in seventh grade that I realized I was able to make my voice sound like other people. And one person in particular was my science teacher and i could really make it my voice sound almost exactly the way he would do it when we would be taking a test he would always go pencils down he would say pencils down and i remember joking with my friends after class and saying next time we do a test i'm gonna say pencil down before the time is up you know like just as a joke and uh so we were taking the test it must have been about 15 minutes in and i did pencils down and everybody put their pencils down and the teacher goes who did that? <laughs> and you know, I'm, of course, I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm still working over here. It wasn't me, <laughs> you, know, you know. So uh, I did that a few times. Eventually, he found out it was me, and he, he was really a cool teacher. So he was like, I like the fact that you're you're working on something kind of cool and unique that you're doing, but um, don't don't do that during tests. <laughs> so I was, uh, you know, encouraged to continue, but uh, just not on his time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so and my first oh, oh no go ahead please i'm sorry we have a little delay in our audio go ahead oh no i was gonna say i'm glad you have supportive people and what you're doing even from a young have that you know when i hear some voice actors when they talk to me when they're um talking about like they didn't really have support with what they were doing growing up or mm -hmm. that it, it kind of took them a while to gain their confidence and just joking around and doing stuff like that but it's awesome to hear that you like had that you know yeah i was lucky and my parents taught me like if you really love something keep doing it you know that was the one thing and i still pass that message on to people it's like follow your bliss or follow what you love to do because it'll eventually 
supply you all the abundance you need to, to get by and to pay your bills and to do all that stuff. You just keep following what you love doing. You know? um, so my first voiceover job, um, it's kind of, you know, I, ha I have, when I talk about it to people, I have two different occurrences that happened that sort of qualify as my first voice acting job. One of them was unintentionally. I was at a school called the Musicians Institute. Uh, it's in Los Angeles. And I was taking the guitar school and um, they needed a spokesman for the school. So when someone was interested in going to the school, they would, you know, want to get the DVD sent to them of, you know, this is the school and here's our different departments and here's what you can count on during the school year. And so I was the in, in front of camera spokesman for that. And um, when they finished editing it, they needed a whole bunch of it as voice act, voiceover, you know, describing everything and reading a script. And so officially that was sort of my first voiceover that I did. Um, but um, working on the Power Rangers in their loop group was the real voice acting job that I got, like where I was actually paid each week to be a voice actor. And so that's kind of where I really started was um, and doing voices on the Power Rangers. Who was your first Power? What was your um first Power Rangers monster? Because I was looking through it and I, I uh, didn't know what you did first. Well, you know, it's funny because, quite frankly, I don't remember like the very first one-liner thing I got. I think the first multiple lines that I got on a Power Ranger show was this character named Louis Kaboom. And uh, he had a few different lines. I remember saying, Louis Kaboom, a lot. Like he'd hit his hands together and things would explode. And, uh, but he had other dialogue besides that. Um, and then I went on to do uh, a character named Rygog in Power Rangers Turbo. And then a little wizard named Larago in also in Turbo uh, and in the movies and stuff. And then I did Ecliptor, which was uh, in Power Rangers in Space. Um, and then later, many years later, I did Zenaku, who was in uh, Power Rangers Wild Force. But uh, yeah, sometimes you get like a one little line here, one there. And, you know, I've done 400 different shows in my career. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to remember the one line that was the very first thing you ever did. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's challenging. It's like they say, what's your favorite part ever? And it's like, well, if you have 400 children, who is your favorite child? You know, I have like maybe 10 of them. I can say, oh, I love this because of this and this and this. But um, it's harder to pick just one or to remember just one for that matter. Sometimes fans will come up from Naruto and they'll be like, oh, yeah, in episode 37, when you asked, uh, you know, and I'll be like, you know what? That was like 18 years ago and it was 35 <laughs> minutes of my life. I mean, if I ask you what you ate for breakfast in 2004 on December 11th, you're going to be like, I have no idea what I had for breakfast, right? You know, all the breakfasts I've eaten are good, but I couldn't tell you what I ate, you know, 14 years ago in the morning, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, it's all been a lot of fun. I've been, like I said, I'm, I'm really blessed that I followed my dream and I'm able to continue to be an actor. You know, I do acting every single week and, and I coach it sometimes and I direct different shows and, you know, I still do music and, yeah, that kind of thing. So I'm always counting my blessings, you know, counting, finding something to be grateful for each day helps me get through these difficult times when people are like, not people, when I and my wife and, you know, we're just quarantined to our house, basically, especially we live in Los Angeles and they're under a really super high, very strict lockdown right now. It's like, if you don't need to go somewhere, don't, you know, it's like, if it's the pharmacy or the supermarket, that's it. Otherwise, you're, you're basically don't go walk, don't go out and walk, don't jog, don't go to the store for just like random stuff, you know, keep it, keep it very few and far between. So feeling grateful for something each day is a great way for me to like reboot and go, okay, there's a lot of stuff that's happening out there that I could easily focus on and be afraid of or be, you know, anxious about. Instead, I'm just going to be like, let me think of three things I'm really grateful for right now. And then that kind of lightens the load of, of feeling stressed and, you know, feeling like, you know, doom is around the corner. Not Dr. Doom, but, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, doom and gloom with all these news reports and all the stuff you see on TV. I try to, I try to keep, you know, the news 
very few and far between. You know, I'll check in in the morning and maybe in the evening. And if there's some emergency pops up on my phone, I'll check that out. But for the most part, I don't stay glued to the television. I try to just like, you know, do things that are creative or take care of things that I've been meaning to get to since I'm home and I, I can do it, you know, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think I veered off on the question quite a bit, but <laughs> I'll do that probably on every question, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing amazing. How have you, so how did, how was the adjustment to quarantine like for you? Because I know some voice actors talked about like, oh, they had to like rush out and make a whole home studio or how did you handle all of the news when it broke in March? Um, well, I'm really luckily, I have a home studio already and I've got a vocal booth. It's actually just a closet that's here. I'll show you, I'll give you a quick tour of my booth. Uh, <laughs> this is my studio. And uh, if you can see, I'll go in the booth. Okay, here we go. Let me turn this light on. Here's my booth and you can see the microphone and, you know, a couple things like that. And I usually just stand like, you know, here and do my, this is kind of a funky light, but I have another light. <laughs> and then I do, you know, my voice acting and it's all, you know, got the insulation around it. So I can't hear anything from outside and um you know i just go in and i do it and uh when the whole pandemic hit i was lucky because my you know it was already fully functional and i could just continue working uh when there was work i mean work slowed down dramatically for everybody it's, it's kind of picking up again you know i'm staying pretty busy again but um initially it was like uh oh everybody hold up <laughs> you know yeah, I feel like, again, more to be thankful for because not everybody who's out there has a job where they can work from home. You know, a lot of people are in the service industry and they're just like, oh, I can't go to work. I don't have a job. I don't know how to pay the rent, you know, that kind of stuff. That's, I, you know, really feel for everybody out there suffering from that right now. Hopefully this will all end soon. I mean, I, I honestly, even when I think or talk to people about uh, Corona and this virus, I'm still like, I can't believe we've been in this since March. Like, think about it. We've been in this since March and we're almost done with 2020 and we're going to be doing this even into the new year, even yeah. with the vaccine and stuff coming out. So it's just so crazy to think that we're still dealing with all this. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably going to be at least till the summertime till things normalize again, I think. You know, it's gonna, we're going to be vaccine for a few months and you know, we got to get through this winter because winter is going to be the time where, you know, the normal flu season hits and then people catch colds. And, you know, it, you know, if it packs the hospitals too much, then that's when it gets really risky for people who are at risk, you know, people who are obese or who have heart problems or respiratory problems. I mean, that's the majority of the people who are, uh, you know, people have heart disease, things like that. They're, they're the ones who are really at risk and who die, you know, when they catch COVID. I know a bunch of people who've gotten COVID and who've gotten better, you know, so there is hope. Um, there are some lingering things that happen in people's lungs, you know, they, they have difficulty breathing for several months or have a little bit of brain fog after they've, they've had COVID for a bit. Um, but uh, for the most part, the people I know have made good recoveries, which is great. You know, it's not a death sentence if you get COVID, it just means you got to really take super good care of yourself and get your immune system up and running, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but to answer the question, uh, yeah, I was, I was happy to know that my studio was at a quality that worked for the people who were wanting to do it remotely. Some people might not know this about you, but I see in the background, you got a guitar and drums. You're a musician as well. So how did, I am. how did music get into your life? Like I said, I was, uh, my parents urged me to play music in that school band and stuff, but I, you know, the, the, the violin and the French horn aren't very cool. <laughs> they are now, like if I could play violin now, you know, I'd plug it into my amp and you know, play rock and roll violin. But um, uh, when I was about 14, um, we had a piano at my house and my brother, my older brother, like 12 years older than me was uh, 26 and he was a great piano player. So I would watch him and just kind of be like, oh my God, I wish I could do that. And so he basically said, okay, don't, don't worry about having to learn a bunch of stuff here. Just play these keys. He would play like a bass note and he'd say, just play anything in the, the white keys. 
and he'd play some stuff and it would sound kind of good and i was like oh that's cool and then he'd just start playing the black keys and he'd say okay i just play the black keys with me and then i play those and it would be like oh that actually sounds kind of good too and so he said all you got to do is you know play these three or four notes and then you can improvise with your with your right hand when you're playing it and you'll be able to play some music so i started playing piano by ear when i was 14. and so um I played that for a while. When I was 18 years old, uh, my mom gave me a, a real old acoustic guitar that had been kind of floating around the family for a while. And I played that for a few years. And uh, my girlfriend at the time bought me a, uh, the guitar is called a Les Paul, but it's, a, it's an Ibanez Les Paul copy. I still have it and um, really cool, heavier guitar, but I really didn't know how to play guitar. I was just barely learning a couple of chords. And I heard, uh, a friend of mine around that same time who did know how to play the guitar he came over and he plugged in his distortion and his phaser pedals and he put it through a really cool amp and it was like wow and i was like oh i like that that sounds cool you know and so i started learning guitar and and you know getting into rock and roll and uh, getting into all different styles of music and learning how to play the different styles and, um, yeah, since then I've had a, a love affair with the guitar big time. Uh, like I said, I went to the Musicians Institute when I was 23 years old and uh, graduated there. And, and uh, since then I've been in a bunch of different bands and I still have music that I release even to this day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I love music so much. It's been, it's been like a, s a saving grace for me uh, over the years because um, I feel like you can really get your emo. I, I do for myself anyway. I can get my emotions out that I might not otherwise express through the music and through the guitar. And whether it's sadness or anger or happiness, I can always like express that through the musical instrument. And so it's an extension of me in that way. Yeah. Well, let's dive deeper into that. What does music do for you that acting doesn't, and then vice versa? Um. I think one of the biggest things that me, one of the biggest differences between music and acting for me, and my wife pointed this out, my wife is voice actress Sandy Fox. Some of the people watching might know her. She, you know, she plays a variety of different characters from uh, Chibi Usa on Sailor Moon to Betty Boop and Hello Kitty and, you know, a variety of other things. You know, she's been doing it longer than I have. Um, but she said one time, and it really struck a chord with me, no pun intended, uh, that um, with music, when you write a song or you play music, that's your words, you know, the songwriter's words. So when I write a song, that's like coming from me. That's Those are my pieces of emotional content or my story or whatever it is that comes right from me. Whereas if I'm doing acting, I'm taking somebody else's expression of a story or their feelings or whatever, and then I'm connecting to those in order to portray the character. So um, music is more more um, authentic to my own personality, I guess, and is more of an expression of like the real me compared to like playing a part. Yeah, so that's what it means for me anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of, um voice actors are getting into music or trying to have started in um started in music and have transitioned over to voice acting and i've always been intrigued on like why a majority of voice actors i've spoken to at least have all are just naturally inclined to go to music it makes a lot of sense yeah and then also with voice acting and music you know the connection to those is music develops what's called your ear and so you know what you're listening for tones you're list you, you become a better listener and a, a, a lot of times when you're being directed by a director in voice acting they might say like pick up the pace take a beat here or um it might be like listen to the music of the voice if you're listening to a japanese reference for like an anime show or something they'll be like listen to the, the music of what they're doing there or let's try to change the music of the voice and if, if you're not if you don't know music and you hear that from a director telling you that you might go like the music of the voice what's that but if you're into music you go oh yeah i see how the melody of the voice you know um plays a part in it or if you're doing like a voice sound alike 
like let's say when I teach people about doing a sound alike, I say you have to listen to the music and the voice. So let's say you're talking about Christopher Walken or somebody. If you're listening just to the music, you can hear there's like a oh oh oh, oh you know, like that's like the music of it. And when you put a word like wow, it's crazy, you know, your friend, you hear like all that kind of like oh oh going on in the in the impression or the sound alike. So that helps to be a musician because you can identify with the tones and the pitches and that sort of thing and the rhythm and the pace, you know, the the, the, the uh, tempo uh, of of what you're doing. So I think that's a big reason why uh, voice actors gravitate towards music and vice versa as well. Do you know James Arnold Taylor? I do. Yeah. He does a great Christopher Walken. Have you heard it? It's crazy. He sounds just yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, Christopher Walken. Now everybody does like a Christopher Walken. That's why I say like it, anybody can do it. I teach you know in the classes and stuff. But uh, back in the day when like there weren't a lot of people doing Christopher Walken, it was like there were only a handful who could do Christopher Walken and Sean Connery, and like those were the two big ones that everyone was trying to do. Now everyone does their Christopher Walken and Sean Connery. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Speaking of voice acting, let's go into Star Wars. So, what was your history with the franchise before working in it? A fan. You know, I was a, I think I was 10 years, was it 10 or 11 years old when it came out. And I, my brother took me to it. We, I remember waiting in line around the block from the theater. It was like right when it came out, it was like a phenomenon. And, um, you know, we waited probably like three hours in line to go see it. And when that, when the uh, 20th Century Fox thing comes on and then, dum, da -da -dum, you know, like the big music hits. As a kid, you're just, I was just like, oh my God, you know, like, and when we, when it finished, I was just like, oh my God, we got to see that again. We got to see that again. <laughs> yeah. I had to wait a while to see it again because of, they were sold out for weeks you know it was just like one of those things where one major big theater in arizona had it and it was like just sold out forever and uh but then um you know i didn't really get too deep into it as a 10 or 11 year old i mean I, I i got deep in the sense where like i bought all the posters and i had my walls covered in star wars posters and they had this stuff called doodle art where you would get a set of pens and you would make your own that you'd get like a uh, uh, a lithograph kind of thing that was just black and white and you color it all in yourself and then put it up on your wall as a poster and I had a bunch of those in them. so to that extent I was into it but it wasn't until high school when they re-released it um, in I think 1980 they re-released it and um, I think that uh, it was pretty cool because um, at that point my friends in the drama department and I thought hey let's memorize the movie Let's like see if we can memorize what's called the New Hope right now, but what was just the first one, you know. Let's see if we can memorize it. So we memorized the entire film, and uh, we would go around in acting class, just like picking a scene out of nowhere and just like doing scenes over and over in our acting class of Star Wars. And then after that, it was just you know staying a fan, and you know obviously seeing Empire Strikes Back, and then I saw uh, Return of the Jedi. Um, with a group of friends and I was one of those people who waited overnight to go see it as the first show and then the next day you know I was definitely one of those overnighters and um, and then it was more fandom after that and it wasn't until after I had become a voice actor that I had a chance to audition for Han Solo and uh, you know at that point at that point, I started getting more into being a lot of different characters in the Star Wars world. Yeah, the rest is kind of like, it was just like an evolution of different auditions and different, you know, opportunities that I was lucky enough to have. Now you voiced Han Solo in the original Battlefront 2? No, it was, uh, I started in um, Rogue Squadron 3 for GameCube. And then I was also in Battlefront 2, and I was also in uh, several other games, you know, throughout that whole period where it was uh, PS2 and PS3 uh, and game uh, Xbox also. Um, but my first one was Rogue Squadron 3. That was the first one I had to audition for. And then after that, they used me in different games 
uh, thereafter. You did an amazing job. I just want to say I did a great job as a oh, hot thank you. No, no, no. I, I was going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. We got no, the delay going in the, on. In the uh, new Battlefront 2, that would have been so cool to hear your voice just to come back. Well, I am back. I am. I play Poe Dameron in the new Battlefront 2. So you hear me going, I'll come back for you. You know. <laughs> And all the other things that Poe says. But uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. I, you know, when I was 16 years old, my friends and I would go to sci fi conventions, kind of like Comic Cons now, basically, but it was just mostly Star Trek and it had also a few different sci fi things. And around that time, Star Wars was just getting, you know, big in the convention circuit. And uh, I cosplayed as Han Solo when I was 15 and a half. You know, I was with my friends and we would all decked out and I was cosplaying as Han Solo and uh, when I ended up getting the card for Rogue Squadron 3 I ended up calling my friends that I hadn't seen in like 15 years uh, we just been keeping in touch you know via emails and whatnot and I was like you'll never guess I'm playing a character in a Star Wars game and they were like yes and I said take a guess who and they're like I don't know I said Han Solo and like we were all jumping around screaming and yeah can you believe it we were dressed up like that you know it was like you know went from being a cosplayer to actually being the real character for a real star wars thing so that was that was pretty exciting you know for me as a, as a big fan what was the audition process like for being han solo well uh i have a voice at a voiceover agent and so the voiceover agent would call me and say we've got an audition for you so i'd come in and I saw it was Han Solo. So uh, most of the lines were lines that you would know from Han Solo. You know, watch your mouth, kid. You're going to find yourself floating home, you know, like that kind of stuff. Uh, and so uh, we did the audition and they were auditioning in uh, New York and Chicago and San Francisco and in Los Angeles. And on something like that it's a pretty big audition so all the agencies and all their actors and everybody gets it in each city and then they kept boiling it down and then my agent called me and said okay it's down to 16 people four from each city and you're still in the running and i'm like great and they said well they want you to, they want you to listen to some han solo so pardon me so they um sent me a bunch of clips of just Harrison Ford as Han Solo without any effects or music or anything, just like right from the tape of, you know, the Star Wars movies. And I really listened and listened and listened and kept repeating it and trying to get all the nuances because there's a lot of different kinds of Han Solo nuances when he, depending on how he's projecting or what he's talking about. Um, and so uh, I did that over and over until it was down to me and one other person that was in New York. And, um, Eventually, my agent called me and said, hey, good news, you're Han Solo. I was like, that's wonderful, thank you. I hung up the phone, I was like, yeah! You know, I was like running around the house, you know, not, you know, screaming like a kid, like just, hoo -hoo -hoo, hoo -hoo -hoo, you know, just running around. It was pretty fun. And then, of course, I was so excited. I'm always excited to do Star Wars stuff, you know, in general. And so I try to keep it in check a little bit because I don't want to seem like such an uber fan that people won't want to work with me again, you know, like, uh-oh, here he is again, you know, <laughs> that Star Wars kid again, you know. So, yeah, I tried to keep it kind of cool and reserved. Oh, yeah, this is very neat. Yeah, this is very cool. I'm so glad I got this, you know. When inside, I was like screaming like a kid, like, I can't believe I'm here, you know. <laughs> yeah, I still feel that way. Even when I'm recording anything Star Wars, it's like, okay, pinch me. I somehow got in the door, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know of course i realized i've been cast in something or brought in specifically for something so i i let that go but um yeah it's a real thrill and, and that audition was fun too another character you play is major gorog and uh, i'm saying that right uh von reg von reg sorry i von... haven't seen resistance yet. no it's funny is i'm gonna watch resistance tonight with a couple of my friends so oh no. cool yeah Ma major von reg is is the name of that guy so who who is he? What is he about? Well, he's a first order uh, Tie Fighter uh, major. He's like one of these special forces guys in the first order, and he comes from this aristocratic family that has all these privileges. And uh, he basically has this really badass uh, Tie Fighter called an Interceptor. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they have like these pointy front pieces. Yeah. You know, real really cool looking. 
and you know he's he was around in the timeline of like star killer base and captain phasma um but that like she is his superior um but he's like a really like really skilled tie fighter pilot like you know he'd be considered the ace of tie fighter pilots and dave filoni the guy who uh, created his him as a character said that they always wanted there to be like a red baron in star wars you know just an incredible ace fighter pilot guy and so they created major von reg uh, and they uh he's got a red tie fighter he's got a red suit you know so he's like the red baron literally <laughs> real, real real cool character though it's really fun what intrigues you the most about that character um i think i think it, well the fact that he's so skilled as a pilot you know i he, he, i don't want to do any spoilers but his fate is a little bit uh, well, how do I put this? I won't do a spoiler, but um, you know, I I think that he's the kind of Tie Fighter pilot that might just survive the worst of the worst, you know. And uh, there's nothing official about him necessarily surviving anything that he may or may not have come across. <laughs> I'm trying not to spoil it for you, but um, <laughs> but uh, it intrigues me of like how skilled he is, and also. It's fun for the character to be sort of without uh, connection to um, having like morals or, or having any kind of like a sense of emotional content. He, like he's a lot more reserved. He's a lot more distanced, and uh, so that's intriguing to me to play a character like that who's kind of cold and, and heartless, you know, and so. Um, that's pretty fun. That's a fun experience to do. I'm really excited to get into it. I've heard so much stuff about Resistance, so I'm just really excited to see what's about to happen in it. So, yeah, it's good. It's a real. It's a great show, actually. <laughs> what did you enjoy the most about working on Star Wars Resistance? Um, well, it was the first animated series. The Star Wars animated series that I worked on. I tried to, you know, I auditioned for many characters on Clone Wars and Rebels, and you know, I, I saw those. Bless you. I saw those. I saw those series like come and go. You know, like they would uh, seasons would come and go, and I was like, darn, I didn't get on that one. I just got to keep hoping for it. You know, keep working towards it, keep making my auditions better and better. And so, one of the great fun parts for me was actually being cast in it. Um, also. The show itself, you probably have seen clips at least of it. It has a really cool animation style. It's 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 not quite anime, but it's sort of got that um, stark contrast between the colors and the shadows and how they draw uh, the characters overall. It's really kind of a cool uh, animation style that Star Wars hadn't used before. It's like two D, three D in a way. It's weird. Um, and then the the um, the sessions themselves were always really fun because it would be, you know, I'd be there with like a, a wonderful group of actors, you know, that are still very active. Um, some of them might be recognizable to you, uh, but other like veteran actors, like a guy named Fred Tattashore or D. D. Baker, uh, D. Bradley Baker, um, James Arnold Taylor, uh, I think he played a couple of little things on that too, but um, but mostly like D and Fred and um, the the producers were all super nice and everybody was so welcoming and uh, it makes going to work really cool. You just get there and it's like everyone loves Star Wars and everyone's there to make a great show and everyone is supporting each other and it's like you get into the room and you can feel the energy in the room and you're like, this is great. And initially, um, when I first got cast as it, as it I, I was not only cast as Major Von Reg, but I was also cast as Poe Dameron also. And I did the first 11 episodes as Poe Dameron. And at the 11th episode, um, Disney got word that uh, Oscar Isaac, the actor on camera that does Poe Dameron, decided he wanted to do Poe Dameron on the show. So it was good news, bad news, good news for the show, bad news for me. <laughs> but, um, 
So he he came in. None of the episodes had been released yet. We had just only recorded eleven of them. You you record three or four at a time. So we'd have like three voiceover sessions. And um, when uh, he accepted, you know, he decided he wanted to do the role. I came in one day like, all right, what are we gonna do? We're all ready. And and it, the director kind of was like, uh, we gotta talk for a second. And he's like, Oscar Isaac decided to take the role. Uh, it's his role, so I not take the role, but he, he accepted his offer, and uh, we're gonna go ahead and he's gonna come in and do that. You know, so I was like, okay, you know, you win some, you lose some. My character's still alive, at least. You know, my other character. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, those who watched the whole show know what happens to him. Um, but yeah, that's what I loved about it. I, I, I really, I really love just being part of that ensemble, being able to contribute my you know take on von reg to the whole ensemble was star wars resistance always intended to be two seasons because i was kind of confused when they were like oh well it's at, uh, over is over after two seasons um so well the way animation usually works and i don't it, it's not like a steadfast rule but it's just an in general rule is that near the end of the first season of whatever you're doing the networks will either pick it up for another season or they'll say, okay, conclude it at the end of this season. And so at the end of the first season, it was kind of the end of the story arc for Major Von Reg. They picked it up to continue the story for the second season. And I guess at the end of the second season, they got what they needed in terms of story accomplished. And they said, okay, I think we're going to wrap it up at the end of this season. So. I, I worked primarily on the first season, and I did a couple of stormtroopers on season two. But um, Major Von Reg was already out of the picture in terms of the storyline of, of uh, season one. Now let's switch over into one of my favorite animes of all time, Naruto. Okay. Now you put the character of uh, Tenchi, saying that right? Te Te Teuchi. Te Teuchi, okay. Te I'm sorry, I'm very bad with pronouncing names. That's all right. <laughs> I also played. I also played the fight proctor named Hayate Gecko. Yes. And he's the guy who had, you, you know who he is because he'd be calling all the fights, but he also had a little cough, and so he sort of sounded like this. He's like, next up, Naruto. <coughs> he had this <laughs> mis mysterious cough of which he did not die of. Uh, he was later betrayed by some other characters and and. Uh, killed by them but he uh, uh, came comes back later in the arc to um, sort of avenge his death as well as rekindle some romance with uh, the, the love interest he had um, later on um, I played a bunch of different characters in the Naruto series there's so many episodes that they, they call in actors like hey could you play this Dumo character for one episode or can you play these guys for an episode you know so I did a lot of that, but my two main characters were Teuchi, and he's the ramen shop owner, and uh, Hayate, who's the fight proctor. What do you think the character of Teuchi brings to the world of Naruto? Mm -hmm. Well, I know a couple things. One is, you know, he'd often ask Naruto, like, what have you been up to? Or like, what, what's, what's been going on? So it's kind of like a... A recap sometimes Naruto would say like what he's been doing and like bring people up to speed um, I also think that uh, he had a, you know he, he had the ability to like make a break from the action like there's all this action happening that Naruto's eating ramen you know like the action kind of breaks and he also provided a friendly character you know he was always friendly he was always supportive he was kind of like you know i won't say comic relief but he was almost like tension relief for this the show itself and i think that's what it brought that's what it brought out of me and that's what also it brought to the story is is more of that jovial side and, and stuff like that what does the character bring out of you yeah the same stuff uh it's a reminder to stay uh, you know, have lightness of being and stay, you know, light and positive, you know, and when things can be going bad, like keep your positive side alive. I think that's what it does for me. What voice were you going for when uh, they told you about him? Well, we tried a few different voices, but what was funny is at the time I was thinking about, 
my wife was doing a Muppet show. She was on the Muppet show around that same time. And um, I'd been walking around the house doing all these different Muppet um, later piggy and like doing like, you know, Kermit and Rolf the dog, you know, and that kind of stuff. And when I saw Teuchi, I was like, maybe he could sort of sound like Rolf the dog. <laughs> you know, So I kind of aged him up a little, Rolf the dog, you know, kind of thing. And and so that's what Teuchi ended up. It was kind of like, you know, based on uh, one of, I'm not sure Jim Henson did that voice, but one of the Muppeteers uh, vocal ideas. And so we just tweaked it a little bit here and there and it ended up sounding, you know, just right for him. <laughs> that's so cool. I'm so- I love that character. Like you say, he just brings um, sort of this like tense tension reliever and sort of a safe a safe spot for these characters. You know, some of the characters been there: Kakashi, Captain Yamato, Sakura, Sa- You know, you see all these yeah. characters. You know, and uh-huh. great character. I'm still on Shippuden, so I'm excited to see where this story story goes. Because I've watched. Um, I started Naruto, I want to say, in August, and I'm still on it. I mean, that just goes to show how many episodes there are, I guess. <laughs> hundreds upon hundreds of episodes. It was like 800 episodes or something crazy like that. Yeah, I was looking at it uh, all together. I think it was like a thousand episodes. Is it over a thousand? Okay. Yeah, it's a lot. So, so now let's switch into DC, the DC verse, the comics universe. DC New Boys world, Batman. Yeah. How excited yes. were you when you found out you were voicing the Dark Knight himself? I think very is an understatement. Um, I had been called by um, Mattel Toys the first time I had to do Batman. And uh, they called me and said they're getting ready for some new like, 10 inch a- action figures. And they said, uh, we're looking for a Batman. Uh, I mean, obviously, there there have been several voice actors who have done Batman, just like on-camera actors. There have been a ton of them. But, um, you know, when I think of Batman, I think of Kevin Conroy because he's been the longest, uh, you know, Batman career of any of the Batman. You know, he's like a go-to Batman. And so when Mattel called, they were saying, well, we want to be sort of a Kevin Conroy style, but we want it to be make it your own. And, you know, it's got to be going to be coming out a little tiny speaker about the size of a dime so we need to like test it and make sure that we can get the intensity and the strength and the you know superhero quality to come through so we had to do a lot of that um so that was really fun it was exciting to do that for mattel but it, it still didn't feel like i was doing an animated series at any time and then uh dc called me and i don't know if because they heard the toy or just because um you know, I'd been doing voice acting for a while already, and they said, we have an audition that you're, uh, we'd like you to read for us. And so I read for a show called Batgirl Year One, which was uh, in a graphics, uh, motion graphics series that was put onto iTunes. You can still get it. It's a really cool series. All about, like, the origin story of Batgirl. <clears throat> And so for that, they wanted kind of a Christian Bale version of Batman. They wanted everything down in here. You know, they wanted it sounding like gravelly and you have no right to be here kind of Batman, as opposed to the you have no right to be here, you know, a little more clear. Thing. And so um, I was super stoked about that. I, I got to play some of the villains in the show and Batman. So I was really, really stoked about that. And then I'd been doing a, uh, a lot of work with Warner Brothers uh, on different shows like The Batman and Justice League Unlimited and things like that. Not playing Batman, but playing Captain Cold and the, the Metal Man and the Gas Man and the Heat Wave and, you know, Atomic Skull and all these other characters. And um, Andrea Romano, who was the uh, director for those, she's retired now. She, she really, I, I owe a lot to her for my... Uh, animated career but um she called and said called my agent and said we'd like to cast lex as these two smaller characters and batman and i was like oh my god they're gonna cast me as batman what wait what is this what is this show you know and i read the script they sent to me and and the the script was uh, from a, a story arc called knights of tomorrow and it's basically when 
um, Batman gets to an age where he hands over his cape and cowl to Robin so he can become Batman and fight the Joker's grandson. That's basically the story that Alfred's telling in this Knights of Tomorrow story. So I was Robin playing Batman. <laughs> so when I got the script, there's a scene where uh, Joker's grandson is, you know, talking to him. He's like, who do you think you are? Or something like that. And Batman's up on a ledge and he says, I'm Batman. And like, I was like, I was so excited to be able to say in a Warner Brothers studio and in a Warner Brothers cartoon, I'm Batman. And so I felt like I practiced it like that. I was walking around my house for three hours, probably just saying I'm Batman over and over and over and over. And I was like, every time I did it, it was like deeper and deeper and more rugged and meaner and everything. And I was like, I'm Batman, I'm Batman. You know, and I was like getting ready. I was so psyched and I got to the studio and we were recording and we got to that part where he had to say, I'm Batman. So I said, I'm Batman. And the director I'm there, said, oh, wait, hold on a second. Uh, I just want to give you a quick note. This is Robin as Batman. Well, even though, you know, he's still badass and everything, he's got to be a much higher voice. Like he's much younger. And so it's got to be like, and I was like, okay, I'm Batman. He said, no, pitch it up. And I was like, I'm Batman. She's like, it's got to be higher. You know, and I was like, I'm Batman. And then she's like, can you go any higher with that? And I'm like, I'm Batman. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> I was like, it's not feeling like Batman anymore. I spent the whole weekend going, I'm Batman. You know, like trying to get off. And uh, so in the end, he just goes, it's really normal sounding. Like, I don't know who you think you are, but I'm Batman, <laughs> whatever. And it's, it's still super cool. Uh, when we recorded it, uh, after I said, I'm Batman the recording stopped and everybody stood up and applauded because only a, like a dozen people in the whole world have ever said I'm Batman at the recording studios of Warner Brothers, you know, so I joined this elite group of, you know, 12 or whatever it is, people who did have done that. And um, it was, I was tearing up actually, because I was so moved by like, oh my God, look at this. I'm here at Warner Brothers and I'm sitting with the greatest director in the animated world and I'm surrounded by these incredible voice actors and celebrities and I just said I'm Batman I'm gonna I'm gonna cry <laughs> you know so uh, I was tearing up pretty good saying it and um, you know that's that's what that's what I went through when I when I got cast uh, and that's like a story that I tell my friends about but um, such a thrill i mean can you imagine like someone saying you're gonna get to play batman and something you'd be like oh my god that's the greatest news ever (laughs) (laughs) a goal of mine well it's not like batman but a goal of mine is um because i'm taking voice acting classes now is um my goal of mine is i want to be miles morales and when i get when i get that call that hey you're miles morales and like a Spider-Man cartoon. I'm punching a wall. Or Wouldn't that be I'm great? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you so, can do it, man. I'm, like I said, you know, the beginning, just keep keep following what you love doing and keep practicing at it. You know, practice makes permanent. And the better you get at something, the, the more practiced you are at it, the better you'll be able to perform. Yeah. That's why I love talking to voice actors. All of their knowledge is helping me a better voice actor and get into the zone so i just love yeah it. yeah so, thank you for coming on again oh, um, absolutely yeah another character you played in the dc versus the candle maker in doom patrol now i sadly have yeah to too but who is candle maker and what makes him so scary because if you look at him he looks like a demon <laughs> like an ancient demon yeah um basically candle maker is like the there's a well that's a that's a that's a real long story but more or less candle maker comes from this uh girl's imagination and the way that the universe is working in that story is that like she can bring these characters almost to life in her imagination but one of them this candle maker guy he realizes that if he can get her to make three wishes that he will go from being in her head to being a real thing like an actual physical character on the earth plane so um through the use of his uh, manipulation and as he becomes uh, a stronger character in her psyche he 
uh, gets her to make these three wishes and he becomes a real character. And he's got like, you know, super strength and um, he can basically touch you and you vaporize like on, on touch, you know? So he's got like this fatal touch, they call it. Uh, he's, he's got multi-dimensional manipulation. So like he can think something and then it'll happen. And so like he can kill people from afar just by like multi-dimensionally log, logging into their being and blowing them up and stuff. And so he's a real mean, real mean fatal dude. He's like as, as fatal as you can get in a crazy villain. Yeah. So that's that's really fun to play too. You know, playing villains is always super fun because you don't you can't be a villain in real life. It's, it's fun to play them. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could, but there's a lot of consequences that come with it. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> How excited were you to find out that you were going to be on Dude Patrol? This is one of their biggest shows uh, currently. Yeah. Yeah. Another, you know, again, very excited. I audition. I I always have to audition for things. You know, even even to this day. Every once in a while, someone will call and say, oh, hey, I, I heard you on this. I'd love you to come in for this. But I think about 99.9% .9 of the time I audition, just like everybody else. And then when you get the call that you got the job, it's always very exciting and nerve wracking also because you have to, you know, these productions are like huge, you know, multi-million dollar productions. And, you know, you're in the spotlight and you got to really come through for them. Uh, and so there's a little nerve wracking that happens there but for the most part if i just relax and have faith that what i'm bringing to the project is unique to me and that i'm contributing to a, a greater good for the project smooth sailing you know um and and those big projects always have a real good director they have a real good sound supervisor you know people who can guide you for performance notes or just character understanding and things like that yeah so again super psyched um, i'm really excited for the next season because they left it on a cliffhanger this, this uh season and candle makers right in the center of that cliffhanger and so when they start back up i anticipate that the candle maker is going to be making a return to either continue his wrath or to get defeated in some way along the way so yeah super cool i love i love dc characters too they're a lot of fun have you guys started anything yet or is it just... not yet not yet we're still on like hiatus but I, i've seen some articles talking about they're getting ready like in january to like fire up the writers again so that they can start writing the next season and usually once the writing is done then production happens pretty quickly thereafter yeah it depends how covid affects their production yeah, I because a, a, a character like Candlemaker, you know, is after the fact because it's CGI character. The actors, when they're shooting the actual show, are probably looking at a tennis ball on a green screen going, no, you know, <laughs> where <laughs> once it's all CGI'd and it's all edited and everything. And that's when I come in to, to be the Candlemaker voice for whatever they've created. Speaking of comic book characters you've played let's talk about victor von doom the greatest yeah. marvel villain to ever grace the comic books what voice were you going for when you did dr doom because I'm, I'm i'm really intrigued on that aspect of the character because you do an amazing dr doom you are personally my favorite dr doom voice actor oh. you just bring something to this character that i just i don't think people have done as well as you have i mean shout out to all the voice actors that have come to the Doctor of Doom role, but you just bring something that I just I just felt fall in love with. So Oh that's awesome. Thank you. That's very cool. Um yeah, you know again when we were I auditioned for it and I provided a few different takes because some of them he's from Latveria, so like some of the auditions that I did were very they had a lot of accent on them. You know, like that kind of thing. And then I did others where it was just sort of Doctor Doom. You know that kind of feel and so i provided him three or four choices and then when i got cast in it the director uh, at the time uh, jamie simone who's a, cast, a casting and a, a, a voice acting director basically sat with me before we started and he said okay i like this part of this audition and i like the accent but let's dial it back like 80 percent so it's just a hint of an accent i really like the 
calm intellectual style of him i like the fact that he's not he doesn't get his feathers ruffled by anything he feels so confident in his own power that you know they don't even get how powerful he is in his mind he's like you you're like flies here you know i'm not going to even bother you know waste my time by annihilating you that's how infinitesimal you are to me you know so um we sat and we talked about all that stuff about his intellect and about all that stuff and then we uh we just picked the finished version of that voice and said that's going to be our doom so yeah that's that's kind of the process of, of Dr. how Dr. Doom became but how the voice for Dr. Doom was established Dr. Doom was only in two episodes which I was shocked to learn because I thought he was in more but the show didn't last too long sadly um, which sucks I really wanted that show to continue um, yeah Avengers Earth's Mightiest Hero was a real fun show it was really actually one of my favorite Avengers shows of the ones that have come out not just because I was in it but because it was a cool show too in my mind yeah, I was also Doctor Doom in uh, Marvel Heroes: The Video Game. Uh, so, when you, if you ever play any of those, you know, um, Marvel Heroes or a variety of other shows, uh, that's that's me also in the in the Victor Von Doom chair. <laughs> I love it, love it. Do you enjoy playing heroes or villains more? Um. I think with heroes, there's a certain strength that you can bring to a hero character, but with villains, there's a certain insanity that you can bring to the character. And so what's more fun to play is unreeling some of that insanity in, in the character itself. So I would have to say villains are more fun, but heroes are also, you know, strong to play and they're rewarding as an actor to play a hero. But villains have you have a little more leeway with what you can do character wise. Yeah. Right. Which character did you have the most free reign on? What character be, of which one? Of any character I've ever played, you mean? Yes. Or just like. Uh, I think uh, this character I played for. Uh, for a game called Crash Bandicoot. It's, it's uh, Dr. Neo Cortex. He's like the main villain in the Crash Bandicoot series. I think with Dr. Cortex, especially in the first couple of games that I did, which was called Crash Twin Sanity, and um, I can't remember the name of the second one that came after Twin Sanity. I'm sure your fans will know, but um, the, the, the scripts were, were outlines for what Dr. Cortex could do. So the director said, okay, we'll read it as is in the script and then just give me what you think would be funny or give me what you think would be a good improvisation. And most of the improvised stuff ended up in the game. It was really, really funny. It was a funny game. Now we're going to jump into my Rapid favorite part. fire. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Welcome to Weird and Wacky, where you have a minute to answer random and weird questions. They're going to be rapid fire one after another. No one has gotten to 15 questions. The one who has come the closest is Tara Platt. Will you be her record of 12 questions answered? Yes, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm about to start the timer in three, two, one. Okay. Longest time period without taking a shower. Longest what? Time period without taking a shower. Two days. Weirdest food you've ever eaten? Octopus. Would you rather eat a thousand bees or a thousand cockroaches? Cockroaches. Super proud you've won in real life. Um, time travel. Worst smell. Worst smell? Worst. Smell. Dog food. <laughs> food you refuse to cook. Eggplant. Least favorite video game. Zelda. Favorite video game. Uh, yeah. Favorite video game. Um, Four. Right now, Arizona Sunshine. Two, one, and that's time. What up? <laughs> well, wait, wait a minute. I, you know what? I, I think I ruined my own score here by asking what the questions were again. It was kind of hard to hear some of them. 
I should get an additional 20 seconds to answer. What did I get? Like six questions? I think about eight. Around eight. Oh, okay. (laughs) And I don't know that Zelda is my least favorite video game. You know, my least favorite video game is probably something else. Um, (laughs) I'd have to think think about it a little more. Um, Yeah, my least favorite are the type that are too hard to play to get past level one. (laughs) (laughs) My, my most favorite are those I can play with my friends. I said Arizona Sunshine, but I just got an Oculus uh, Quest, and they have this zombie game on there called Arizona Sunshine that you can play with friends. And my friends and I used to really love those, uh, like Dawn of the Dead and those kind of movies when we were teenagers. And so it's kind of fun to actually be able to go in virtual reality into those environments and like be a hero inside those environments. So that's why I said it was my favorite at the moment. but. Yeah, I can't. That's like picking a favorite child again. Like, who, who, which one do you like the best? Which one do you not like the best? You know. <laughs> My last question before okay. I ask, I just want to say thank you so much. This has been so much fun to do with you. I've been trying to get you on for a very long time. I, I was nervous to ask, long. but um, I was nervous to ask. I'm so glad that you agreed to this. And oh yeah, my pleasure. So. What is your current message to the world during these current times that we live in? Obviously, we're in a pandemic, Black Lives Matter. We have so much going on around us. There are people who are scared for the future. What would you say to people right now who are in need of hope and are just scared? (sighs) Well, um, Firstly, you know, it's okay to have feelings of fear or sadness or anxiety. You know, that's just a normal thing when you're dealing with all this stuff. But don't let that be what defines you. Don't let that be what you what you decide to do on your everyday life. Like, don't let that be what governs that, you know. Try to stay connected to that part of yourself that's sort of like your higher self. Because there, you know, fear doesn't have a chance. You know, it's like, um, it's almost like, you know, I'm a meditation teacher also. Um, I don't know, not everybody knows that about me, but um, and one of the things that we talk about, like when I teach people meditation, is like un- underneath like all the mental activity you have and outside of the roles you play in life and the positions you have as jobs or the possessions you have in your house, when you move all the positions and the possessions and the roles you play and the identity stuff out of the way, who's left? It's like a being that's left. And that being that's left has a connection to what I call the infinite organized intelligence. Okay. It's kind of like, you know, some people call it God. Some people call it consciousness. Some people call it, you know, uh, you know, different names. There's probably a thousand different names for it. But the idea is this that part of you that's connected to that is the same part that like like um an acorn has this blueprint inside it and when the conditions are correct it grows into this mighty oak tree we don't have to call the acorn in the morning and say hey acorn make sure you grow into the oak tree it's already organized and it's intelligent and it grows same with the planets outside of our bodies. We look up at the planets, we look through the telescopes, we see Saturn and Mars and the moon and everything. Um, and we don't have to make a phone call to those every morning and say, hey, planets, don't collide with each other. Be sure that the universe stays in order. It's intelligent and it's organized already. We don't have to worry about calling it. And then when you think about it, inside our bodies, that same intelligence happens. We don't have to call our spleen in the morning and say, oh, hey, spleen, please filter blood cells and make sure to produce more white blood cells for my immune system. It's already working. And if we create the conditions for it to work at its maximum level, like our immune system, vitamins, good food, things like that, it's already gonna create the immunity we need to stay safe and to stay healthy. And so if we can take a minute each day to sort of remember that that part exists within us, then it takes the pressure off all the fear and it takes the pressure off of like having to control everything and like, oh no, I can't do this, I can't do this. It's more like, you know what? I'm gonna allow the universe to work out the details. I'm gonna create the conditions for good health by what I eat and exercise or whatever it may be. And then, you know, outside of that, when you go back to your roles you play and the positions you hold in life and the possessions you have, 
then, you know, do what you love to do. Follow what you love doing and let that be your guide to, you know, how you create in life and, and where you go and like going to the next right thing to do in life. And so I would say a good way to do that, to get connected to that part of yourself that's that inner being is to start with that gratitude thing when you first wake up just think of three things you're grateful for and then you might have heard like when people talk about meditating they're like just become aware of your breath and they talk about like being aware of your breath well what that does is it brings you into the now moment instead of like worried about the future or concerned about what happened in the past all that is cleared so that you can sit in that space where you're like you know what Right now, I'm part of that bigger organized intelligence, and I'm just breathing, I'm being, and then you, you, you eventually become aware that the universe wants your greatest good to evolve. And so you stay connected to that little piece of that big piece of you that's inside, and then the condition becomes correct for that great thing to evolve, and, and your dreams start coming true. And, you know, because if you if you go down the path of fear and you focus on it and you put a lot of attention towards it, you're going to find all these things that are fear based appearing in your life that give you reason to be fearful. But if you take the opposite side of that coin, then you're going to find that there's some good things that are keep appearing in your life to give you reason to not be fearful and to be hopeful. So that would be my um, message or whatever to the world. Don't forget about that organized intelligence that lives inside of you already, because that's what's real and there you have it <laughs> words <laughs> of wisdom <laughs> Lex Lane oh, thank you so much that was amazing you did a great job an amazing guest to have on I would love to have you on again one day we can literally sit here talking for hours and upon hours about all the yeah. amazing work you do but I want to oh, you're wonderful get... thank you for the compliment absolutely um, I would love to have you on to have like a mental health discussion I'm big on mental health, like because of my past experiences, I'm very big on taking care of your mental health. And I feel like, I don't know, I'll, I'll tell you more about it, but I'm just big on mental health and how you handle it. So thank you for the work that well, you do. Well, anytime you want, if you want to do another show sometime where we just talk about meditation and talk about that infinite organized intelligence that's out there, I could probably talk for an hour about it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'll be looking forward to it. Guys, thank you so much for wa uh, watching. I'll leave a link Thanks, guys. to all of Lex's socials in the description. Uh, anything you want to plug before you go? Yeah, you know, just standard stuff. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm, I've, I've been kind of laying low lately just because I want to I want to stay centered, uh, you know, because sometimes if you get too into the social media, it, it throws up, makes you feel imbalanced a little and you, it's an easy way to get depressed by like you start doing this comparative thing where like, oh, wait, they did this. I never got to do that. Oh, they're doing this. I don't get to like and then you start self deprecating and then next thing you know, you're depressed. So. I like to just keep it short and sweet when I go on social media, you know, check in on friends and family and, and do a little hello thing here or there. But um, uh, yeah, so normal normal social media outlets, you can catch me on those, the top three anyway, the uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, and TikTok, top four. <laughs> and Lex Lang, you just look up Lex Lang and you'll be able to find me. And guys, well, I'll see you on my next interview. And um, you got it. Thanks everybody for tuning Thank in. Thank you. Have a great one. See y'all next time. Bye-bye.